we had just sat down to a great Thanksgiving meal. And as we got into the meal, enjoying it, the phone rang. My wife went into the other room and took the call while I was trying to be polite to the, to the folks who were over for dinner on that day. We all tried to, to talk with one another, but we couldn't help but hear my wife's frantic words in the other room when she said, He did what? I knew immediately what she was talking about. It was a call about her older brother. Doug had had a tragic life from about age 25 after. He was an amazing man in the sense that he grew up with a natural ability in business. And in fact, by the time he was in his mid-20s, he had literally made multi-millions of dollars, was a wealthy businessman in San Diego. And then, and then something began to unravel in his life. Went through various times of depression. We now call it bipolar disorder. And that ultimately would slip at times into schizophrenia and some psychotic breaks where Doug did some really bizarre things. On this particular day, Thanksgiving Day, he had been in a psych ward in a ho local hospital and my father-in-law had, had checked him out to, to join the family for Thanksgiving dinner. And when my father-in-law turned his back, Doug stole the car and drove away. My wife hung up the phone. They were out looking for him. They had no idea where he was. And, and we went on with our dinner, but as you might imagine, we were very uneasy. In fact, I had a, a feeling in the gut of my stomach that something really bad was going to happen that day. And sure enough, the phone call came very quickly. My father-in-law and Doug's brother had searched where they thought they might find him and actually had seen some police cars off in the distance. And they drove to the top of San Diego's tallest bridge where the car was abandoned, surrounded by police cars, and Doug had jumped over and taken his own life. Thanksgiving Day will never be the same for us. And I'm very grateful to God that God has brought healing in our family and, and caused us to see, as the years have gone on, caused us to see some of the good that might have come from this, this tragedy. We would have never chosen that sequence of events. But speaking just for my wife and me, we have an unusual sensitivity to folks who are going through depression. We actually had Doug come and live in our home for a period of time before he died. And to understand, as some of you have learned from your families, to understand depression is a difficult thing. And God has given to us an ability to relate to students, to relate to others who are going through some of the depths of depression. We've also been brought alongside those who have gone through the tragedy of suicide in their family. And I would have never chosen that, but God had a plan in our lives to be able to minister through that. I'm thankful that God healed our family and has taken us on in this area. I'm also really thankful that all trials aren't that bad, would you agree? Doesn't your Monday morning sound a little bit better after I told my story? We all go through some tough times and thankfully they're not, they're not as tragic as that. And yet, as we go through even the small frustrations of life, there are things about them that tend to get us sidetracked, that tend to get us derailed. I, I want to give you three things as we begin this morning, and especially I'm speaking to those of you who may be going through a tough time right now, a trial. Number one, you need to know that you're not alone. When we're going through t difficult times, it seems like we are all alone, and yet around you, our friends and fellow students, you, you don't always know their story, but they are struggling with some of the same things that you are. We look in the scriptures and in the Bible we find great individuals who went through very deep times of trial. You're not alone. Secondly, if you feel like crying out to God and even at times just venting yourself in doing that, God's word gives us permission 
One of my favorite teachers and writers is Tremper Longman. And I know, I know this last week he spoke on this very subject in the Psalms that, that the lament Psalms give us a way to express ourselves to God. And that's okay. God calls on us to do that or invites us to do that. Third, and here's something I want you to listen to very carefully because if you'd hear nothing else I say today, I want you to hear this. When you're in the midst of a trial, it seems like God has forgotten you or abandoned you. Now listen, not only has God not abandoned you, but he may be doing his greatest work in you right at that moment. And if that is true, then it is always too soon to give up. It is always too soon to give up in the midst of God's greatest work being accomplished. This morning, we're going to look at primarily a passage from Romans. And I'll put these on the screen. Some of you may have your Bibles along. You want to look at Romans 5. I'm waiting till that comes up there on the screen. There we go. Romans 5, 3 to 5. We won't be able to unpack everything that is in this passage, but I want to focus on one part of it today. Paul says this, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Now there's a lot of wonderful things in this passage. The work of the Holy Spirit as we go through trials allows us to connect in some way the love of God with the difficult times of life. But the part of the passage I want to focus on is a process that you see reflected there in the first part that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character brings hope. I placed also on the screen a passage out of James that many of you will know very well, because I really believe that we have here almost the, the reassurance of the Holy Spirit that this is such an important truth that the Holy Spirit has also conveyed it through James who would have actually written his book much earlier than Paul would have written, and we find a very similar process. Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You see, this process is a process that is producing in us something that is deep in character. I must be pushing the wrong button, there we go. Something that is deep in character. That we would go through a time of suffering, we call it by different names, a trial of some sort, that we would go through that time, respond to it, and God would, in the midst of that, be doing something really great. In fact, as we, As we talk about this today, it's my conviction that in the midst of a trial, God is accomplishing something that he can accomplish in no other way. In no other way. And the process that is going on is a process of building. Now, this word that we find for suffering in all of these passages is is really a word that has to do with stress or pressure in our lives. It could be all kinds of different circumstances, but the the word itself is a word that really refers more to, to the experience in our lives of being under pressure. And out of this, God is going to produce something good. But the old saying that many of us have used when we've tried to get in shape, and I mean getting in shape, exercising, no pain, no gain. I know at different times I've been really out of shape and recently trying to exercise more and to get back in shape, I joined a gym. You know, some of those experiences there are amazing in a gym. Um, 
I think a treadmill is one of the most amazing futile experiences you could ever imagine. <laughs> to be on a treadmill and not get in anywhere and why are you exerting all of this energy? Well, because you know there's a payoff. There's a payoff to get in shape. Getting in physical shape is a great parallel in the scriptures to getting in spiritual shape. And what God is often doing through the pain through the agonizing of exercise as he is building us to be stronger people. One of my Talbot students, Jeanette Hagen, actually is a Biola graduate also from the year 2000. Jeanette was raised in a family, a wonderful loving family with three sisters and one brother. One of those sisters in her family was born into the world with severe brain damage. Now the doctors, at the time she was born, said she probably will live less than a year. Well, her sister went on to live 42 years, and in fact just died this last spring. Well, I could go on telling you the story, but I actually brought Jeanette along this morning to give you a little glimpse of what God did in her life through this experience with her sister. Jeanette, would you come up and join me here? Well, as Dr. Hutchison mentioned, um, I did grow up with a sister who had very severe brain damage. And this is never something I would have chosen, but it's something that God worked so powerfully through. To give you a little better understanding of what it means that she had brain damage, um, she, the doctors actually measured her IQ at some point to be about four. She never developed um, past the state of an infant mentally and was essentially a quadriplegic with only slight movement in her hands. Um, growing up with this was a challenge that shaped my life. It was a, a struggle as I grew up asking questions, uh, trying to understand what was wrong with her why God didn't heal her, um, how I should pray for her, and the purpose of her life and suffering. But one of the ways that God worked through her suffering uh, was that his presence became very tangible to me. Uh, the Lord was faithful to meet me in my struggle, and I did experience his comfort. But more than that, uh, the Lord taught me how to pray. I can remember when I was in junior high, and um, I'd be away with friends, maybe on a youth retreat or other fun experiences. Uh, were supposed to be fun experiences. And there were times when I would feel so overwhelmed with grief, just suddenly and unexplainably. And I would start thinking about my sister Jackie. And um, what was interesting to me was I would come home and find out that in those times she had gotten very sick or would come down with pneumonia. And through these experiences, the Lord uh, taught me to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and intercede for my sister. But not only did he teach me to pray, he taught me how to pray. I mentioned that I prayed many, many times for God to heal my sister. I thought how wonderful it would be if he would do a miracle of healing in her life. Um, but as I went through high school, I went through this time where that prayer not being answered caused me to feel very disillusioned, and I basically stopped praying and stopped seeking the Lord because I just didn't know how to pray anymore. And it wasn't until I was in college and here on this campus that I was challenged again to continue enduring in the spiritual struggle concerning God's purpose for Jackie's life and her suffering. I wrestled with passages of scripture like Mark 12, 24, which says, believe that you received all that you pray for and it shall be granted to you. I believed God could heal my sister, but the question was, would he? Well, through many intense times of prayer and seeking, God showed me through the Holy Spirit and through the scriptures that faith is a gift that he gives as we seek his will, as we submit to his higher wisdom um, and our, apply ourselves to seeking Him, um, He will be faithful to give us faith for the works that He wants to accomplish in our lives. 
So I began to change how I prayed. I prayed for God to be glorified in her life. And, and through this, I began to see that one of God's greatest miracles is the works he does in our hearts. He taught me how to see past the external realm of things. Uh, he taught me how to see past my sister's physical limitations and see that um, in her spirit and her soul, she was capable of so much more than I could see. She couldn't respond to me um, with her voice. She had no voice. She couldn't communicate in words, and she couldn't reach out to me with her arms, but began to realize that there was a deeper level of love that God was trying to show me through her. And ultimately, um, this love that God taught me moved me to um, share God's compassion with others who are suffering. And, and specifically, in the same time I was struggling, God was leading me to administrative working with orphans. And the lessons I learned through my sister's life um, gave deep imprints in my, my soul. Believe that um, God can change the external circumstances that um, orphans are going through where the world is telling them you won't make it in society. I believe that God can do a miracle to transform their lives. Um, I can honestly say that I rejoice in the sufferings that I went through with my sister and because of the things that God did in my life in teaching me um, about prayer, his presence in my life, and the compassion he taught me. And I am confident that my sister Jackie, as she now stands before the, the Lord before her maker would say the same thing, knowing how God has redeemed her sufferings um, to bring so many others into a knowledge of him. So this is the hope I have for the future, knowing that what we endure in this life is but a drop in the bucket compared to the eternity of the glory we'll share with Christ in heaven. Thank you, Jeanette, for sharing a bit of your story with us. I want to think for a moment here, how, we, how do we usually pray when we are in the midst of some kind of a problem? I don't know about you, but my most common prayer is, Lord, get me out of this. It's, it's the desire to escape it. And I certainly understand that. In fact, as we have seen this last week in the series, Scripture gives us permission to pray that way. The Psalms often, the lament Psalms often cry out to God, Lord, deliver me from this. Go to the New Testament, we find that Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 tells us of his thorn in the flesh and he says, I prayed three times that God may remove this from me. And of course, Jesus story of the greatest suffering that any human being would ever go through. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, Lord, if there be any way that you can remove this cup from me, it's okay to pray that God may take a trial away from us. But I wanna to suggest to you that in every one of those cases, as well as in our own experiences, there's another prayer that we can pray along with that and Jesus, again, in Gethsemane exemplified it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. A friend of mine, a couple of years ago, was going through a really tough time. And I came alongside of him, as any good friend would do, and I put my arm around him and said, Don, I, I just want to let you know I'm committing myself to pray for you while you're going through this trial. I'm gonna pray that God's gonna take this away from you in a way that will be so swift that you'll really know that God is God. And Don's response was, I really appreciate that. I need your prayers and I thank you for doing that. But I want you to add one more prayer to that. Would you pray that if God chooses not to take it away, that he would give me the grace to go through this, but more than that, he said that he would give me an understanding of what I'm supposed to learn, of how I'm supposed to grow through this trial. And then he said something that I'll never forget. My friend Don said, I'm trying to learn in life how not to waste experiences. 
That's a fascinating idea, isn't it? We need to grow and learn how not to waste the experiences that God has brought our way, and a part of those may be the endurance through this. In fact, I wanna, I wanna go now back to that, that process that we've been talking about, where suffering produces perseverance, ultimately producing growth in our life or character building. What is this perseverance all about? Well, as many of you may know, other translations of the Bible put a different word in here. Sometimes we find the word patience, and that's a good word. Sometimes we find the word endurance, and that's a little bit better word. But my favorite translation of this is perseverance. Why? Because patience kind of, I don't know, in, a, in the English it gives us a connotation of something passive, that we kind of sit back and let something patiently happen. But no, that's not this word. This word in the text this word in Greek is a word that's a very active, engaging word. In fact, in English, we have a verb that goes with this, to persevere through something. It's a stick to it It's an unwillingness to give up. And here we find an amazing parallel to God being at work and what he calls on us to do. That as we make our way through a trial, we realize that God is doing something important here and realizing that I'm going to stick with him. I'm not going to waste this experience. I'm going to wait and see the things that he might have for me in, in life. I placed on the screen here one of my favorite quotes by a writer named Margaret Clarkson. Clarkson says, it's not by miraculous deliverance that our faith grows but by discovering God's faithfulness in the midst of our pain. That perseverance is so hard. It is at times so gut-wrenching. I, I used the illustration a moment ago of, of physical exercise, of getting in shape. And very much as we look at the scriptures, we see that there are many examples of the running of a race and other other athletic events that seem to picture things that we do in our lives. I want to show you a picture of my daughter, Kara, and this would be one of the proudest moments in recent years of her. Kara lives in, uh, Kara's by the way a Biola graduate and from the late 90s and she lives in Portland, Oregon. Any people from Washington, Oregon here, the Northwest? A lot of Biola people up there, I think you know that. And my daughter and son-in-law, both Biola graduates, live up there in Portland. And Kara set out this last year to train for a marathon. Any marathon or half marathon runners here? All right, so we've got a few that are in shape in the group. Uh, Kara, well, Kara is not a runner. And in fact, all of her life, she's done various kinds of exercise, but really not running or jogging. But she set out to meet this goal of in, in a year she was going to train to do a marathon. And this is October 4th, as she makes one of the corners in her 26 mile run, and she made it, she finished the marathon, and not only that, gotta brag a little bit about my daughter, she finished in the top third of the women in her particular age group, someone who's never run marathons before, and she did so well. And I talked to her a lot about this, because I've never done anything like that. What, what was it like? What did you have to do to train? I know this whole year she's gone through a rigorous training exercise, getting up every morning at five o'clock out there running. She has two little babies, our grandchildren, and yet she got up early in the morning. She went out running while, while Casey was still at home with the kids, trained and went through all of the various lengths of runs. 18 mile run back in August, 21 mile run in September. Some of you have trained for marathons. You know that as you work your way up, you're, you're getting runs that are almost there. And I said, well, Carol, what, do, what was it like to run the 26 mile run? She said it was exhilarating and it was grueling. She said, when I passed 21 miles, I, was, I had so much adrenaline going, I knew I could make it, but everything in my body was just crying out to quit, to quit. Or if, if you're not gonna quit, at least just start walking. 
You don't have to run to finish the marathon. And Kara said, it took everything I had to bear down and to finish that race. I think many of you know, as we look at this scripture connected with this, that the writer to the Hebrews uses this very illustration. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Now, I want to finish with just a couple of simple thoughts that are related to this passage. Out of this passage, we see a reference to joy. And in fact, as we look into all of the passages in Scripture that deal with suffering or trials, we find the idea of rejoicing and joy in all of them. What's this all about? It doesn't mean that we enjoy the the suffering or the trial. The enjoyment here is a confidence, is an assurance that God is at work. And my joy comes because I believe that he's doing a good thing here. If we enjoyed suffering, we would be masochists and God's not calling on us to do that. He's calling on us to trust in him and to enjoy the results that come from the suffering within our midst. We also find in this passage a reference to thinking right. Thinking right when things go wrong. This is is not an easy thing to do. I placed here one of my favorite quotes from Chuck Swindoll that really captures, I think, a decision that you and I make on a daily basis, especially as we face the difficult times. Swindoll says, The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. God calls on us to think about the way we respond and our attitudes. And in fact, as we look at this whole process, the opportunity that is there through a trial calls on us to respond in a way that gives God a way to shape our lives. You see, trials can either be obstacles that cause us to stumble, or they can be opportunities that help us to grow. And the operative part of all of this process is how we respond to it. Are we gonna respond to it in a way that allows God to work, or are we gonna respond to it in a way that causes us to be bitter toward God? God promises us the power of his Holy Spirit, and as much grace as we need to be able to respond in the way that will allow for that growth to happen. No pain, no gain. But as we look at the results, we can be joyful in what God is doing in our lives. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I can't begin to express to you how much we love you and appreciate the fact that you are a God who makes good things out of shattered lives, who turns obstacles in our life into opportunities for growth. Lord, we can't, none of us know how to do that very well. We struggle and we at times are discouraged and we even become bitter. And I would pray for any here today who may be going through one of those deep water experiences of life. Lord, would you bring your Holy Spirit in a note of encouragement to cause there to be growth, to cause there to be a response that would allow for you to work. I thank you, Lord, for the difficult times in our lives. We would never choose them And yet you have allowed us to enter into them at times to bring this wonderful growth process. I pray that we might stand back and allow you to do that, to persevere through them, to trust in you amidst them. 
thank you, Lord, that you empower us, that your spirit enables us, that your grace is with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.